So welcome everyone as everyone comes into an actual hockey analytics night in Canada. I know we've had a ton of other sports, so it's really nice to loop back to hockey finally. And I really truly believe we have world-class hockey people and football people uh, on the panels tonight. So I'm really excited to jump into every topic. And we had over 200 people that registered as well as a lot that want to see it after. So Thank you so much for the interest. And I really think this will be informative and helpful for the Big Data Cup. Just a brief overview and some rules. I'm here with Allison, who has helped me co-host every single Hockey Analytics Night in Canada. So we're going to be kind of, uh, you know, manning the ship right now. We have the chat function going. If you have any questions, feel free to type it in there. We'll try to get to as many as possible. We have a very stacked lineup. So we're trying to get through as much topics as we can help you. Anything from intro to R with Megan. Mike is going to touch on data visualization, best practices. You have a world-class person in this environment, so please make sure you get in your questions. Then we have Danny, Lucas, and Matthew, who are big data bowl winners of the NFL. So they've been there. They've done what you're trying to do. Use them. Use their resources. Ask the great questions. And then we're wrapping up with Allison for data-driven storytelling what she does best, writing. And I think that's an aspect of communication that sometimes gets overlooked when we talk about analytics and working with data is how to communicate, how to put it in words and how to get people to actually understand how great your research is. So right off the top, we're gonna jump into a data overview with Dom who we work together, an awesome person to talk about this subject. We're gonna do a high level, two minutes, Dom, you're on the clock. <laughs> Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen quickly. All right, hi guys. Um, so I just wanna kind of quickly run over uh, the data sets that are posted on the GitHub for the uh, Big Data Cup. So um, on the site here, you can access um, the data sets and that brings you to a GitHub link where you have um, NWHL data, um, you have scouting data. So from the Erie Otters uh, last season, and you also have um, women's data that encompasses Olympic games and NCAA games. So um, you have all the data here. Uh, if you scroll down, there's um, some rules and guidelines. Um, and underneath that, it actually goes into detail on the data set. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. Like it's um, translated data from a raw data feed. Um, and it's kind of you know, what we had in mind when kind of making it was something similar to, you know, if you're familiar with scraping data from the NHL with uh, NHL scraper or, or, or scrapers built by Manuel Perry and things like that. If you're familiar with the NHL public data feed, then this will be something similar. Um, so luckily it has more data than, than you see um, in the NHL real time scoring uh, system. Uh, and if you scroll down, you can get a sense of what's in here. Um, uh, one thing to notice is make sure you're, uh, you look at the coordinate convention here, which may be a little bit strange, but it's, a, it's an artifact of how things are inputted in our system. Um, but beyond that, you have all the events. So if you scroll down, you can look at, you have shots, it has all the details, um, everything like that, goals, plays, uh, incomplete plays. So this should have everything you need to decipher what the actual columns mean uh, in the data set. Um, it's pretty straightforward for the most part. There may be a couple of things that need clarification, but in the end, I'll give you, um, or even in, we have the chat function going. So please ask your questions and, and uh, hopefully we'll get to that and we'll add them to the GitHub if we see any that haven't been asked before. Um, and I'll also give my email at the end here. Um, so just quickly kind of, uh, so it's very simple. Um, you want to download the data sets, you can load them right in from R if you just call the URL, um, you can load in the CSV. Um, just a quick example here, like for example, plays and incomplete plays. Um, if you want to see like, you know, maybe this is working with the uh, women's data for Olympic hockey, where maybe turnovers are happening, where you're more likely to turn the puck over. Um, oh, uh, that's my packages. Yeah, so just like that, uh, it will load right into R. And again, the columns are defined just like they are in GitHub. Um, so it's ready to go. Um, you know, if you can fill a little spatial model quickly to see in the offensive can't zone. See our screen. Oh, really? Like our okay. No. Oh, okay. Um, I thought I clicked screen. Okay, here we go. 
Sorry, I'm a bit of a Zoom noob, apparently. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you want to maybe look at spatial data um, here, uh, for example, this is looking at the offensive zone, what your expected pass completion is in that Olympic women's data set. Um, that yellow region essentially saying that pucks to the front of the net are more likely to be turned over. So um, I'm sure that's, that's nothing new to anybody. Um, and I have a gimmicky <laughs> 3D plot here. Uh, a lot of it's, I mean, because you have the coordinate data, like a lot of the analysis is probably going to be spatial, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, you know, that's just a suggestion, I guess. But here's the same plot in 3D uh, for no apparent reason. But yeah, so it's easy to work with out of the box in R. You can pull it right in from GitHub. Again, if you have any questions, they're probably answered on GitHub right underneath the data files. If you have more, uh, ask them in the chat or um, pull this up please just email me. Um, I will answer you and, and hopefully give any clarification. Uh, I also have some office hours next week. And even outside of that, if you want help, you know, I'm always, I'm usually around. So uh, yeah, that's about it. Awesome. And I will note that this is obviously not Stathlete's full data set, but we thought it was really important not only to make it public, but to have as many women's as men's games. So we actually added the whole NWHL tournament in there as well. So that should be accessible and something fun to work on. Uh, with that said, I know Megan's going to jump into a bit more of an intensive uh, R of, you know, if you're starting, how to, how to get involved in terms of, you know, learning to code and what that looks like with this type of data set. So Megan, if you do a brief introduction of yourself and then jump into your presentation, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Let's see. I'm going to stop. Sorry, Dom. Stop his screen sharing. Um, hopefully that worked. Someone just wave or something if you can't see that. Um, anyway, uh, yep, my name is Megan Hall. Thank you um, so much to Megan and Allison both for inviting me to come back to Hannock. Um, and today, yeah, we're just gonna talk a little bit about um, using R for your big data cut project, especially um, kind of from the lens of a beginner, maybe someone who's new and learning to code. And um, I do have these slides are posted on my website and I'll post the link um, on my Twitter too. So if I say something that you think is noteworthy, um, A, that's cool. And B, uh, you don't have to worry about actually writing it down because all of these um, slides and resources are posted and linked. Let's see. Uh, so let's address the um, elephant in the room first. I cannot teach you R in 10 minutes. That is how long I was given for this presentation. And I have my timer because nobody wants to be that jerk who goes first and takes like 25 minutes. Um, so I cannot teach you R in 10 minutes, but um, I think it's helpful from a beginner point of view to really just kind of have an idea of what you can do in R and what are some of the things that R makes really easy. And we'll just kind of, and I'll also talk about kind of a roadmap if you, this kind of piques your interest and you wanna learn more like some resources for doing that, like hockey specific or not. Um, but just a quick disclaimer, like please don't let anyone ever make you feel bad for what like software or language you do or do not use, including me. Um, Everything I talk about today in R, you can also do in many other languages. Um, there is certainly no like requirement for the big data cup that you have to use R or Python or something fancy. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna, but like these are my 10 minutes. So I'm gonna talk about R because um, I in particular think R is um, got a nice like entry point for beginners. All right, so kind of this step zero of this is like, what is R and like, how do you actually use it? Um, R itself is just an open source programming language. You can download um, here the link at number one, just you can download the language itself and then your IDE or what is like the application on your computer that you open and lets you, you know, write and run R code is called R Studio. Those are both available to download for free. And again, those links are in here. Um, the data. All right, so how would you, if you're working with big data cup data, how would you get that data into R? Um, Again, we're doing kind of a real top level um, look into R here, but in general, most of the work you do in R is done through packages. And packages are just groups of functions that other people have written for you to use. And this kind of line I've highlighted here, which is just calling the tidyverse package is basically the first line of code in any R script that I ever write. Um, tidyverse is a really popular and common set of R packages um, that are really good for working with data. And you can see here, I've called these tiny URLs do work actually just to call in um, these big data cup data sets from GitHub. And I'm just using an R function and I'm reading in this data straight from GitHub. 
Um, and you can see this little symbol here on the right is called the pipe. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we kind of do a bigger code junk, but the pipe is what kind of allows you to run multiple R statements together. And it's kind of a trademark of the tidyverse and one of the things that makes it so useful. And we're gonna skip, we're gonna skip a few things because I'm a little worried about time. So um, step two is really just exploring your data. If you get into R Studio, it's really easy to just look at your data like from a kind of from like an excel perspective if you just want to see all the rows and columns laid out that's easy to do there's plenty of little functions for just seeing all your variable names and such but one of the things that i look at um first when i am um looking at new data like this data we're going to look at here specifically the scouting data set is just using like really simple functions like count which basically just create like what you would see as a pivot table in Excel um, for looking at events. So we can do that here and call event and see all of the distinct events that we have in this data set. And you could call multiple arguments to that function. And so we can see that there are levels of detail within all of these events. And so something like that is just easy. So to go through a quick question is just from the scouting data, like among the players who have taken a substantial amount of face-offs, like who has the best face-off percentage? Um, I would not recommend you use this question as your big data cut question because um, not very advanced, but I only have like six minutes left. So I, I can only do so much, you know, groundbreaking hockey analysis work in six minutes. Um, so if you take a look at the scouting data and you just look at the face offs, this is how it looks. It appears that we have one row per event. So one row per face -off, per face off. And you can see from the very useful data documentation that Dom went through, which I highly recommend you look through closely if you're looking at this data, is that the player variable is the player who won the face off and then our player two is the player who lost. But you can see here, this is a good example of like this first highlighted row here, like Quinton Byfield won that face off. And then in the second highlighted one, he lost that other face off. Um, so if we want to eventually get our data where we can look at it at the face off percentage per player, we're gonna probably need this data in a slightly easier format because in the format that we're looking at right now, at one row per face off, you have two pieces of data in that row. You have the winner and the loser. And we really kind of need to get those into separate rows so we can more easily analyze it. And we'll go over that on the next slide. But in general, R is very useful for kind of rearranging data and looking at it at different points of views, which makes it easier for your analysis. And because if we, again, this is where we started off with the raw data. And this is kind of what we want to end up with, which is just list players who have taken a lot of face offs and what their face off percentages are. So, how do we go from that slide to this slide? It looks like this. This is just a chunk of code. It does not bite. Um, but this is an example of code you would run in R, and you would run all of this code as one chunk. And these are all come from um, all of these functions that we'll go through really quickly are from the tidyverse. So we're starting here with an assignment. We're basically telling R that we're starting with this scouting data and we want to make a copy of it and we want to call that face-offs. And you can see that line along with like every other line in this code ends with the pipe, which again is just telling R to um, perform that line of code and then move on to the next one. Just telling R that we want to run multiple chunks of code. And sometimes your code chunks will be really short and sometimes they can be really long, but the pipe is what is really nice and allows you to do all of them together. So if you look at these first two here, um, really easy. Like again, functions, if, if you don't come from a programming background, even just hearing functions, you're like, I don't really know what a function is. Here, like a function is just a verb. Like in the tidyverse, they're just verbs that you're using and you just need to match up with what verb you need to perform whatever actions you wanna have on that data. So like here, for example, we're just asking R to filter just down to face off wins. And then select is the verb you use to select certain columns. So we're only interested in the player columns. So these two functions together are basically just as if you opened Excel and deleted a bunch of rows and then deleted a bunch of columns just to keep what you want. And same with rename it does exactly what it says on the tin. So those first three functions are like really easy and stuff that you can um, easy to conceptualize, like really easy to do in Excel or numbers or some program like that. But when we get into this next function and talk about pivoting, which I think is really where you kind of get into, kind of get your money's worth um, from R, where pivoting data really allows you to um, take data in one form and basically look at it from a different point of view. Like we had mentioned before with this face-off data, we have run row, one row per face-off. We've got multiple pieces of data in that and we want to kind of pivot that so we have one row per player instead. And that's what this function will do. Um, 
like just running this code up to this point will give you this, which just, again, we've just pivoted the data. So now we have each player is in its own row instead of like one row per face off. And that's a super simple example of pivoting, but you can get um, really complex into pivoting longer and pivoting wider. Um, again, of like, I'm in R for like multiple hours a day and I really use pivoting a lot. I think that's kind of where, again, you start to see what how R makes things easy. And again, going through just a few more functions, um, mutate is what you use to create new variables. So we're just gonna create a simple binary variable and also the combination of group and summarize also really popular within the tidyverse um, just allows you to aggregate data so we want to group our data by player and basically just sum up the amount of faceoffs they took and they won and that allows us to of course calculate our faceoff percentage and then we want to filter and then our last verb is just arranging just means sorting and so this chunk this chunk of code which again you would just all run as one chunk gives you this table that we saw before now, I'm not going to talk about data visualization. We know Mike is talking about that, but I just wanted to show one quick slide that it is also um, quite easy to make like nice custom looking plots um, in R. This is the same code that we saw before that creating kind of our face off list. And I just added team to add a little color to my slide, but that kind of stuff also very easy. This is the chunk of code that creates that graph. Um, the package that you used to create graphs is called ggplot, which also lives within the tidyverse. These are the lines of code that you will run just to create the basic, like just a horizontal bar chart. And then all of this is just extra customization that you can do. And again, once you kind of get the hang of just learning different functions and the arguments to those functions, you can chain all these things together real easily. All right, so if that kind of wet your whistle for learning R and you wanna learn more, if you wanna stick with the hockey theme, um, I gave a R workshop at the CMU Sports Analytics Conference last fall. Um, that kind of was similar to this in the vein that I went through a um, hot sample hockey analysis question, but I had 90 minutes instead of 10 minutes. So the question was a lot better and more complex and we were able to kind of go into detail on more um, aspects of R. But those, slides, those are linked in my slides if you wanna look through those slides. I also have developed um, an R package that has some sample NHL data, which again, NHL data is of course different from this data, but as Dom mentioned, the structure is very similar. Um, that package is called Between the Pipes, which is naming that package as perhaps the creative peak of my entire career. Um, I have instructions here for how to access it, but it basically, there are also some interactive tutorials, which have pretty neat little um, code boxes. And I have, you can go through different exercises and there are hints and you can view solutions. So that's a nice way to learn as well. And if you want to not learn in the focus of hockey, I've also included some links to a few of my other um, favorite resources for learning R. All right, there we go. Oh, it's under 11 awesome. minutes. That was hard. There you go. Great timing. And as always, Megan, so clear, but so helpful. And everyone on the call, for sure, check out some of Megan's other resources. They, they've they been great. And I know I've got a lot of feedback from the last Hannah you did, uh, how good they are to learn. So really appreciate it. As always, any questions, just put them in the Q&A, and I'm sure Megan will get to them. So yep. next up we have, now that you've done some R, you've done some modeling, you need to figure out how to make visualizations. What does this mean? I feel like this is something that can go very well or very poorly. So let's get into the brain of one of, not only the best in hockey, but the best in data visualizations business. He reached over a thousand subscribers this week. We can find him on hockeyviz.com. You can subscribe. He needs more subscribe. Don't be the last. Don't be that. You're not the first. You know he's already big time, so you might as well join. Uh, Micah, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to go over how you approach this. Thank you very much, Megan. Um, just as Megan said, I, I run a small website called HockeyViz.com, um, and it's a the recently has become my my primary source of income. Uh, I do a little bit of um, of math teaching here and there, uh, and so you can find me uh, in addition to the website, which can be a little bit like a look up what you need. You can find me um, doing weird and wonderful things uh, on Twitter at ineffective math, all one word. It's a joke about how I used to be a mathematician, but I couldn't get a job. And so, uh, so I've turned to hockey, which is much more rewarding. The, and in particular, um, so I, I kind of came to data viz from, from a slightly weird background, um, in particular from, from science and from mathematics, not from data science and not from statistics. And in particular, um, not from sports. The, 
you know, I, I came to sports sort of late in life compared to other things, um, and which has some interesting relevances for, for trying to come up with, with um, how you want to put data viz together. Uh, and so I, I've, this is just my face, I'm afraid that I don't have any examples for you, and which is a deliberate choice because examples, as you will discover when you start creating your own, especially if you haven't before, examples are confusing and people will seize upon little details in visualizations. One of the most amazing things about visualizations, which can also be a problem, is that they engage people very quickly. And if you, if you write a table, a lookup table that people can look at numbers in, you will force people to work hard. And if you make a data viz that puts the same numbers in a table, you will in a, almost force them not to work hard. And what you want is, should inform your choice of what you want people to do. So if you want people to look at the precise values, you should not use a data viz, you should use a table. And if you want people to grasp a full picture quickly without looking at specific details, then you want a data viz. And so it's very easy to say, oh, I love data viz, I'm gonna have lots in my submission, and maybe you will. In fact, I'm sure, I'm sure every submission will have some, but not every submission will be laden with it. And just like, and so there'll be very legitimate choices about some people will have lots and some people just a little. The, some people will have lots of explanatory text, other people's only a little bit. Some people will have lots of tables. Those, are, those are, are not purely stylistic choices. You wanna make those choices based on what it is you're trying to get across. So part of, and so data viz is one of the things that I spend a great deal of time on. Uh, and the reason I do so is because I think visually. Uh, one of the, one of the like, hallmarks of that is that when I'm looking at data, I frequently discover that I don't understand it. I don't actually know what it says, what it is even, until I've made a vis of it that I'm satisfied with. And, and so the first, the first audience for any piece of vis you make is always yourself. And because it's so different from any other way of presenting information, you can frequently discover that what you're seeing is not what you expected, um, which is a double-edged sword. It's tremendous in the sense that, that you, can, you can discover that you understand what you were looking at much, much better and your code was great and your data structures were great and everything, you know, you say you have some complicated regression model or you have some simple thing, no matter what it might be, you might be extremely pleased with it. And then you might take a look at what its output is, at what its structure is in a viz and say, oh, it's actually not like I thought, it's totally different. And that can be disorienting or it can be enlightening and occasionally both. And so, so one of the things is to be ready for that kind of surprise. The most general advice that I find, the most important thing that I, start with whenever I'm looking at some kind of new thing. Some, you know, something that I don't already have a template for. We'll come back to like templates and, and that sort of thing later on. But if I'm looking at something new, one of the pieces of advice that I try to keep high in my own head is start big. It's very tempting, especially if data viz is new to you, it's very tempting to say, well, I'll just put you know, I'll just have a little bar chart with just a couple little things, something really simple, and then I'll add this other little thing, and then I'll add that other little thing, and eventually I'll build up to something, you know, that has everything I want in it. Uh, and there's an obvious logic to this, and unfortunately, it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is that space, the space that you've got, which is always limited, if you want to make some sort of viz that works, you know, it's not like paragraphs of writing where you can just tack on another one afterwards, and if your reader has the time to indulge you, they'll read another paragraph. You know, fundamentally, viz is like photography. It's about fitting things into finite spaces, and people's monitors are only so big. People's phones are only so big. So, so the art, if you like, is really paring things down. And once you realize that, that might sound contradictory to my advice about trying to put it all in the kitchen sink and into what you're looking at all at once. The trouble is, if you try to put things in incrementally, you'll discover that by the time you're on your second increment out of six, you're already out of space. On the other hand, if you take everything that you know in your head you want to portray, so if you're trying to make a distribution uh, over the rink, you know, over of all of these certain things of a particular set of shots, of a particular set of passes, of a particular set of any particular thing. If you make sure you get them all into the frame one way or another in your first draft, no matter how hideous it looks, you will at least have it all there. 
And then you can work from a place of chaos into a place of something that's clean, rather than trying to work from a place of something small that's presented well, and then trying to cram additional information into the tiny spaces in between what you've already put down and what's left. And if you take that approach, then whatever you put in second will look minor compared to whatever you put in first. And maybe that's what you want, but maybe it's not. And so one of the few ways of making sure that the importance of things can be weighted the way you want is make sure that you get everything in there first. And then you can look at that and say, oh, rats, see, now this is important and it's being obscured by that other thing. And now you can make a serious choice about do I want the first thing or do I want the second thing? Or how can I, you know, why are they taking up the same part of the screen? I need them to not do that. The, you know, but, but if you did it right in the first place, they both have a right to be in the same part of the screen. And now, now you see something you don't like in the viz. You see, oh, it's messy, it's muddy. And you can start to go down a path of, of inquiry with what you're doing that makes sense. And you know that that's where the rubber hits the road because you're looking at the things looking ugly on your own screen. And so then you can say, okay, that thing, I really need that thing. And I really also need that thing. And they both need the same screen real estate. That means I need to redesign this fizz. And, and you already have the seeds of the solution to this problem staring you in the face. Why did I use the same? Why did they both come out in the same spot? Oh, well, that one just needs to be scaled. Okay, then you scale it or whatever it might be. But, but now you're, you're solving the problems that you need to solve, which won't even be clear to you if you only put one of the things, if you try to stack the things in order. So that's, that's the, the most non-intuitive piece of advice that I found extremely helpful. Um, and part of why it's generally better to have more rather than less is that data viz as a discipline, as a, a genre, if you like, is uniquely good at making comparisons easy. People can move their eyes from one corner of a thing all the way to the other corner, back to the top, here and there, Notice, oh, that one's much larger. Oh, that's only half the size. Oh, that's a tiny bit bigger. That, those two are almost the same. You know, those sorts of things, you can make all of those judgments instantaneously, and you cannot do that with a table of numbers. If you discover that you've made a viz, and once you've cleaned it down, there's almost nothing left to it. It's extremely simple. You might even say, do you know, I don't think this should be a viz after all. It should be a table. The, if you need to know precisely what the values are, you can, you can convert it at that point. And that, that process is one that you get used to um, very quickly, that you don't need a great deal of experience for. So attendant to that, part of that, that element of surprise about how you can look at something, there's, there's two obvious ways that you can be surprised when you look at your data. The most obvious one is the one that I already alluded to where you see multiple things clashing together where you wished they wouldn't. The, and one of the things that this is frequently telling you is that the range of outcomes in the data that you're looking at is not as wide as you might have expected. That a number of hockey players or a number of hockey situations or a number of things in your data are much more similar than they might first appear. And if you put those things in a table, you'll make them look more different than they really are because they'll each get aligned to themselves. And so that can be difficult to solve visually, but sometimes that clutter is itself the point. And so you need to make a little bit of peace with that with saying, well, if the, if the message that I'm, trying to, that I'm trying to put forward is these hockey players are all clustered tightly together, then it might be worth letting them all be quite tightly clustered together on your viz, even if it's not easy to read precisely whose name is which. Now you can explain what you're doing in, in text after the fact. Um, but, but those surprises can be really valuable, even if your first reaction to something is, oh, that looks kind of not like what I expected. That's the first thing sort of elaborated. The second surprise that can be extremely valuable is empty space. The, all of the other traditional modes of, of conveying information, the most obvious being um, writing, video, especially tables, don't have any concept of negative space. This is something that's, again, uniquely photographic, which comes up in data viz all the time. If you have you know, a beautiful XY scatter plot and all of the people crunch up here and then a few people are over there and a few people are over there, then in addition to having some idea using the axes of looking up the values associated with the things that are being plotted, 
you also have extra information in all of the areas that don't have any plotted data in them. That says there could be something here, but there isn't. And very, very frequently, and this is the sort of thing that you cannot learn from a table, no matter how hard you stare at it, that there could be a value of this type, but there isn't. Whereas if you put that into visualization, you know, if you see that you just have some sort of square plot and you see that all of the data clusters in three corners of it and leaves one corner of it empty, that tells you something interesting right away about the data that nobody does that thing. And so because you have this concept of negative space that you can use, that if you do it judiciously, which, which takes a bit of experience the, and luck, the, that negative space can give you a great deal of insight. So, so the two things, the two sort of broad points that come from trying to get everything in the, in the kitchen sink in your viz in the first place is that where things overlap, that's a pain, but it tells you something interesting. And where you have empty space, that can feel like a waste, but it tells you something interesting. And so both of those things are aspects that you're going to want to consider when you make your data this. The, I have some other points, but they're all much more minor. And so that's all of my time for today. Thanks a lot. Awesome. And I really like the idea of thinking big and going from chaos to clean. Uh, and also talking about negative space. I think a lot of people don't talk about it as like an art form. You know, we see it as from such a technical perspective, but really you're trying to communicate with a wide variety of people, especially when you have your work this public. So up next, we definitely have people that made their work very public when they won the big data bowl. And, you know, really happy to have Danny, Lucas and Matthew who I believe you're all from SFU as well, or, or a couple of you, uh, and have worked in multi-sports. So they totally know what you're up against for this type of project and are gonna have their top five tips of how you can have a winning submission. So I will pass the torch over to them uh, to give you that rundown. Thanks so much, Megan. Um, and just wanted to thank both you and Allison for having us on and wish everyone good luck for uh, the Big Data Cup. Um, like Megan said, I'm, I'm presenting with Matt and Lucas. And I'm um, sorry, I'm just trying to share my screen. Um, with Matt and Lucas from SFU, um, and that's where we met. And um, that's actually one of our first big tips. And so I'll pass it off to Matt to walk you through um, our, our, our first of our five tips. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having us. Uh, this tip seems almost too easy to go with, especially when you get to be introduced along the lines of Danny and Lucas. Uh, the, the great thing about hackathons is a chance to, to make friends, but also to work hard with great friends and great teammates. And what we found over the years is over a whole collection of hackathons is that sometimes you're in a pressure cooker where it's eight to 12 hours and you're just coding away, or sometimes it's just something you're doing after work for a few hours here and there for the process of a month. And the process is a whole lot easier when you like the people you're working with. Whether you win or lose, whether you work on health data or eat tacos, the process is enjoyable the whole way through when you get a team that complements your skills and also is an enjoyable group to work with. Uh, sometimes the work even extends beyond the hackathon. We, we've had a few fun experiences where we uh, submitted something and whether we won or lost, we were able to turn that into more. And it was a lot of fun to continue working with the same team that you built the original project with. Um, yeah, thanks, Matthew. So yeah, the second point we would like to highlight here is, you know, always think about the story you would like to tell. So your work should be motivated by your story and the problem you're trying to solve. We know many of you have a strong technical background while you're trying to build your models, always think about you know, how your model can fit into your story and don't get lost into the modeling process. We, we actually learned this from one of our um, past hackathon experience where you know, the team with top, top accuracy didn't make it to the final as they didn't spend enough time building a coherent story on their final results. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, um, and the third point we have here is uh, looking for inspiration around you. If you have a brilliant idea, that's awesome, congrats. If you don't, which happens to us a lot, we will often get inspirations from articles, you know, projects, research that people have done before, either in a different context or in a different sport. Sometimes we actually find some really interesting and useful results in the reference section of the paper. 
And you know, we strongly believe that there are values in uh, reproducing someone's work. While you're trying to re re replicate someone's work, you may actually get a better idea on you know, how to translate and apply that into your current project. And finally, don't be afraid to reach out and get feedback from your friends and your mentors. Um, and I will pass it back to Matthew for the next point. And this one may just feel like we're taking things out of the agile framework, but failing fast and iterating often are, are things that we've found ourselves either intentionally or unintentionally doing in all of our projects. It's easy to just take a, a big question and ask, can we evaluate what a defense is in the NFL? But it's hard to figure out where to start with that. And the easiest thing is to fail. So what we do in all of these is we break it down into little chunks, be it 20 minute chunks or two hour chunks, two days or two weeks. And we start small and we build up from there. The nice thing about a lot of these data science and analytics driven projects is that things build off of each other. So your 20 minute solution is not garbage after you're done with it. It's something that builds into a bigger and more robust solution. It also helps build out a story, which Lucas just talked about, as you get an idea of why things failed, where things failed, and what made the next things correct or what made them work more correctly. Uh, I'll pass off to Danny. Thanks, yeah. And so the last question, or the last tip we have here is don't let perfect get in the way of good or sometimes just in the in the way of something. Um, and I think this goes back to Matt's point where um, the very first hackathon I ever did, um, we, we had eight hours to do it and we spent three hours just shooting down ideas saying this isn't good enough. Um, we, we came up with a list of reasons why um, somebody had done this before, which kind of Lucas talked about, like don't be afraid to replicate somebody's work and, and make innovations off of that. Other excuses were like, oh, we're not accounting for enough detail or, oh, we don't have the data to do what we want. And we just came up with all these excuses that would shut down ideas. And, and what ended up happening is we spent three hours finding an idea and we didn't, weren't left with enough time and our project wasn't very good. And what we learned from that and what we look, took to other competitions we, we went to is let's just start with something and that will lead us on um, and, and lead us on a new path. And so... I think a lot of us, when we work on projects, can get imposter syndrome of, you know, this isn't good enough. This isn't, um, I, I need to work on this more. Um, but don't let that stop you from getting to an end product. And especially with kind of these uh, hackathon type projects, um, even if it's a month or two that you have to work on it, um, like Lucas said, or sorry, like Matt said at the start, like we started, we continued to work on projects after the hackathon was over. And so like, think of um, getting something submitted and getting your story out there, and then you can continue to iterate on the model as you go. Um, no work is wasted. And, and as you get to a final product or a final story, you can go back and, and fix the inputs. And as long as the outputs are the same, you can just improve your work that way. So I think a really, really big tip for us and something we talk about all the time is as, as we're working through every time that we have something that we don't think works, really well or perfectly, we document it. And then we address it in our write-up or we try to address it when we go back for a second pass. So I think uh, to summarize this point is, is really document and address it. And I think people really respect and people like, like when you say, oh, hey, here's the things we didn't account for, or here's the things we'd like to work on in the future when we have different data or better data. Um, and so really the, just pushing through and getting a submission of something is, is, uh, is a big tip for us and something that we tell each other all the time when we're like in the weeds of it and like, you know, really criticizing our, our own work. So um, I, I think everyone's really talented and, and just the more you can practice and the more you can learn, the more you can push forward. So those are our five big tips, but I think we're gonna go to the question and answer and unless uh, we're out of time, Megan. Yeah, and I have a, I have a good question from, our last segment too, talking about data viz. Obviously this wasn't the first hackathon you did. How did you approach the visualizations in your reports and how did they maybe change from the first topic or thesis you did into now the football uh, hackathon? Yeah, I think this, this really goes into the storytelling aspect of it. Um, you wanna be able to summarize like all these models into what does it do for, for us and so, um, I think our first NFL big data bowl, when we were doing route clustering, um, it was a very kind of uh, visual project. And so, you know, really trying to make it simple, clean, but also communicate all the information that you want to communicate. So 
you know, remove as many labels. And, and like Mike was talking about with, with white space, like use negative space to your advantage, make it simple and clean, but also get as much information that were the important information to your story in there. Um, and I think that's something that we, we think about all the time when it comes to visualization is just cutting, 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 and then um, trying to just get the main message across in that is. And we had another um, question about, you know, modeling more of the technical aspect of it. I believe you all have stats backgrounds as well, correct? Yeah. I mean, it's a great program at SFU. So you're lucky to have amazing professors out there. You know, what did, what did they uh, teach you and, and what did you kind of go by to, you know, do a project so quickly that it was a, you know, such a technical nature? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I think for, for, I'll take this one in. And Lucas is like, you know, we're, I think we all have technical backgrounds, but Lucas is like the king of the technical <laughs> stuff. And I think the, the thing is like, we know our strengths and weaknesses. And that's part of what working with great, with a great team is that um, you can kind of find your niche. And so even though we can all do the technical stuff and all understand the technical stuff, like we often defer to Lucas for technical things. And then we'll take the viz or we'll figure out what the outputs of the model will be and how we want to visit that and start prototyping the viz even before the model is complete. Right. You don't don't let yourself get hung up on different steps, um, hung up on the modeling step before you start, like trying to figure stuff out because you have a limited amount of time. So um, I think uh, I think Lucas is like, know your strengths and weaknesses and, and find yourself a Lucas if, and to learn from and to teach you. <laughs> we just all um, need Lucas. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I think that the, we've we've learned as we've worked with each other and I think we all push each other. And I think that's what we, we talk about with, with the team is find good mentors and find good teammates that you can learn from. Okay, great. And I had one last question too that came in on Twitter. Uh, and I think this is a good one because I feel like a lot of people in this like shorter time frame now they have about two weeks to, to finalize the submission. How do you decide on the topic? And I know Micah talked about when you're doing data viz, go big, but how big do you really want to go for something that, you know, you are writing a short paper on? Yeah. Lucas, do you want to take this one? Um, um, yeah, so, I, um, yeah, I guess, you know, like, you know, um, I think that kind of comes down to, you know, uh, you know, try to get as much inspiration as you can, you know, try to either talk to your friends, you know, get some inspiration and, you know, find inspiration from, you know, past research. I think those are really like helpful. Um, you know, for our first hackathon, um, you know, we are, you know, we're basically just trying to solve something, like start something small and, you know, try to figure out, you know, what will be the problem and then just do a like tiny little bit step and then, and then, and then building on top of that, you know, uh, over time. So I think it, I would believe that's really helpful and, you know, as important to, you know, um, for, you know, for doing ha any hackathon. Awesome. So it may not all come at once and, and you may not want to do too much for, for a first hackathon or first paper either. Um, great feedback. We need to find a Lucas, get good teammates. I think that's all great advice. Uh, really appreciate the three of you coming on here. And that segues perfect into how to wrap it up, how to actually communicate, what's the writing like, what people will read and understand. So we're gonna jump into Allison's presentation on effective writing, on you know everything uh, to do with communicating how wonderful you've done in the Big Data Cup. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Megan, and thank you everyone else. And uh, just a reminder, please do keep posting those questions in our chat. Um, I know our panelists are, are answering them and, and I might actually, if, if Megan Hall is still with us after she can share her story of how she got into hockey data because I think it's such a compelling example of how something you're passionate about becomes a really cool project that teaches people something. Um, but as Megan said, um, I have in the past um, written, I was a team reporter for the Columbus Blue Jackets. I've written for Fox Sports um, and I have written at The Athletic. Um, so my focus has always been on what I call data-driven storytelling. Um, so again, you know, when we attack projects like this, we spend so much time with the data. We live it, we love it, we learn it. And when it becomes time for us to share our work, to share our findings, our results, I feel like it's often our nature to say, I am now going to detail every single thing I did and every single caveat. I, I wrote a silly little story this week about something and I was 800 words into my process when I realized no one freaking cares about every rule I applied to this data and what I did and how I manipulated it. They just want to know what I found out. 
Um, and so I think that at the root um, is the tip that I would give you um, when it comes time to write up your results um, for the Big Data Cup. Um, we also judged um, the Columbus Blue Jackets had a hack last year and we had a data contest and the writing and the presentation was one of the most important keys to success for our participants there. Um, some of you have seen this before. Um, I always like to share this with people when I talk about writing about data. Um, the Far Side is one of my favorite cartoons and it's like talking to a dog. When we live in this data world, we have, again, like I said, hundreds of examples, tons of words, tons of explanations and things we want to say, and our dog just hears their name. Um, so it is incumbent upon us as the writers, as the presenters, to figure out how to present information in a way that is interesting, relatable, and retainable, most importantly. What's going to make your work stand out isn't just the findings, it's making them compelling in how you present them so they stick with people as something really interesting they want to hear more about or reward. Um, so to that point, what you are going to try to do once you've completed your work on your project for the Big Data Cup is translate and connect. You want to take your analysis and findings and turn them into something that your audience receives and again, like I said, understands. So specifically, I like to call this the Wilson principle. If we have all seen um, the movie Castaway, there was a volleyball and Tom Hanks gave his volleyball a personality. It was a voice, it was a friend he talked to. It was just a volleyball, but all of a sudden this volleyball had a voice. So as you're going through writing up your results um, from your project, Consider what this data has told you. What is the voice of your data? Give that voice to your work through your writing. Um, a writer that I really enjoy that I would encourage you all to follow, um, Seth Godin, he has a blog. He writes almost daily short little snippets. This is literally the entire post um, from one of his posts, but he, I think he does a great job of connecting lessons to stories. And I thought this in particular was really relevant to, to what we should be trying to do as we write up our findings and our projects is pointing out and writing to the difference between data and information. Um, you know, Micah shared charts and things like this. We could all present thousands of lines of code and tons of tables. That's not digestible. What's digestible is what did we learn from this data? What is the story this data told us? And I love the point um, from our previous champions of, what did we learn wasn't the case from this data? So again, and, and we're all smart people here, we can read this, but, and I'll show my slides as well afterwards, but um, think about turning data and your work into information. Tell a story. Don't just present a bunch of data over and over again. So specifically, when it comes to writing up your big data bowl project, here is your goal. Your first goal, um, as we heard from our other speakers, define your problem. And again, find something that's compelling to you, something that's interesting to you, that's going to be that motivation, that passion when you're annoyed because you don't know the right verb in R or you can't get you know, your viz to lay out the way you want, but you care enough to keep going. So first define your problem and do that in your writing. The very first thing you should tell us in your submission is, this is the question or questions I was seeking to answer so that we know very directly what you're after with your project. And then describe what you found out. Again, like I said, a lot of times, at least I think for speaking for me and some of, some of those I know on this call, we wanna tell this whole story of how we got there. And parameters are important, but this isn't about every single step you took along the way that can be in supplemental information that could be in supplemental code, but get right to the point. What did you find? What is the answer? What is the interesting factoid that came out of all the work you did? And then most importantly, why does it matter? Um, you know, again, I'll, I'll cite Megan's work that she did with pulling goaltenders a few years ago. First, it was, it's interesting to see trends. But then this is the recommendation for teams going forward that I have found from my data. This is the application. We can look back and look at what happened, but we really elevate our storytelling and really elevate our work when we say, and now moving forward, this is how it could be used. Or this is how it could be used, meaning don't ever, ever do this ever again, right? So in your written work, these are the key points you should be touching upon. 
So in your writing, there is some detective work that you're going to want to take on. And it's not just the coding. It's not just playing with the data. Do your homework. Uh, know if maybe this is your first foray into hockey or into a, a sport or an area of the game or the women's game versus the men's game. Take some time to understand um, the world in which you're quote unquote living in your project. And again, what language does your audience use? If, if I'm writing for readers um, on a team website, my language is very different than if I'm writing for my colleagues in the analytical space versus if I'm writing for my boss versus if I'm talking to my husband about a stat that he maybe doesn't understand yet. So talk, think about what your audience wants to hear and use that language not your language. Our judges are going to be not just technical experts, but also subject matter experts. So how do hockey people understand what you found? How do technical people understand the work that you did? Find those languages and key into that. How does your audience like information? You heard about visualizations, you heard about using different things. I'll show you a few quick examples here at the end, but when is it important to present things visually? When is it important to present things in written form? When is it important to use bullet points? Bullet points are huge visual tools that are actually words. So think about the most effective way to present information so your audience is going to digest it. Use examples. Um, even if you don't know who the player is or who the team is, um, when I think back to the Columbus Hack Data Contest last year, you know, our, our top award winners were telling us the story of a team that they saw did this and this is why it worked tell us those stories. Um, don't just stay extremely clinical and say, if player does this, then team will get X result. Tell us the story, connect us with what you're trying to teach us. What did you find out? We talked about this. What is the result, um, both good and bad? I loved that point. And what's most important? Um, what is the key takeaway here? Again, you know, I love that point um, from the group before of saying, you know, we could spend our time worrying about 100 things or we could really focus in on a few key things to, to nail down what we found as a result of our work. Um, I love this quote. Um, hopefully some of you know or should know if you don't already, Asma Tumi, who uh, her team just won this past year's um, NFL Big Data Bowl. So um, be simple, but don't sacrifice simplicity um, throughout your work. And when it comes to communication, your communication is simple to put kind of a bow on all of that really complicated work that you have done that underlies what you've learned and what you've discovered. So finally, um, that means as again, all this homework, it sounds like it's more work you thought this was just about data and data manipulation and finding an analysis result, um, but you do need to work for your audience. Don't just be a black box. Um, we do want to hear some of your analysis. Um, if there's a specific modeling technique you used, a coding language you used, um, tell us the intent and the analysis underpinnings of what you did. Um, understand what you did. Um, that it, We can tell if you don't know what you're talking about. Um, translate, we talked about that using your audience's language and slow down. Um, again, we want to throw a thousand things at our audience. Um, we're so proud of what we've done and we should be. I mean, working with this data and doing this kind of work is a huge undertaking but allow yourself to pace yourself in how much you present, when you present it and outlining it in a slow and comprehensible way. And that is all I had. I think that was right about 10 minutes, Megan. Oh yeah. We're Hopefully I didn't go over it. Tonight. Probably the first time in the history that we, maybe we should have done hockey more often. <laughs> we would have actually uh, been on schedule, but amazing to all the presenters for sticking to their time frame. I think we've answered most of the questions. Any other questions, you can obviously email at any time, bigdatacup.statleads.com. I know Dom has opened up his email as well. Feel free to get those in or on Twitter. Megan has already posted her slides from tonight, so you have a great resource there. Obviously, all the panelists are wonderful. We really appreciate all your time and insight, and you know, we all hope that we can do as great of work as, as you all do on this panel. So thank you so much again. Thank you to Megan Hall for updating our website as well uh, for Hannock. So this event will hopefully be posted there after this evening for your reference. Uh, thank you to all the NHL teams that are gonna be judging and looking. So it's a really good time to get exposure uh, for your work. And at the Ottawa conference too, we want even uh, not the finalists, but everyone who submits to have some sort of uh, you know, uh, 
area to be able to put their posters. So anyone who does put in work, like Danny said, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just get it done, get it in, you know, start the process. This might be, uh, you know, your first ever hackathon win, and it might be the first one that you won't win, but you'll win the 50th one. You never know. So always worth uh, the submission. As well, uh, just a couple housekeepings before we end. The open office hours will be updated. So any questions or last minute questions you want to get in, uh, there should be uh, NHL teams and other uh, experts in the field to help you with 30 minute sessions. So take advantage of those, a really good time to have nice face time, have great chats, throw some of your more detailed questions. Once you go from that chaos to clean and you need that extra hand, uh, you know, you can uh, pop into an office hour. So make sure you follow us on Twitter or follow Big Data Cup. Uh, hashtag to get that information. And thank you to everyone. Totally amazing that we're on time. Uh, and yeah, just good luck with all your submissions. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.